Okay, let's let's start. Uh, um, today we're going to talk, uh, to talk about uh, feedback and stability. So shifting gears a little for just um, this lecture and maybe part of the next uh, from sort of transistor schematics back into a little bit more system stuff, just so you can understand, give you some context for like what's happening in the lab, why you need these compensation capacitors, and especially for next week, how to calculate the Miller um, uh, capacitor, et cetera. So uh, be a little bit of a refresher on the systems theory, but also in the context of what happens with uh, with all PAMPs. So um, we'll talk about the feedback uh, amplifier frequency response first. Um, Let's say we have an input VI um, and a classical uh, sort of configuration where we put some um, amplifier in the loop. And then we'll take part of the signal of the output signal and feed it back. Um, Call this V feedback, and this will be our error voltage. Now, this F is we'll, we're going to go sort of uh, down the road into a lot of different discussions about what types of feedback we can have, uh, shunt series, etc. So, right now that doesn't really matter. All that matters is that this F is some fixed ratio between zero um, and one. Okay, and so. Uh, it's frequency independent. Uh, okay. And so if, if we take a look at this uh, circuit and we're trying to derive what is the overall A of S as VO over VI, we're simply going to get uh, A of S over 1 plus uh, a of s times f, right? Because we have v error is v o times f minus and then times a of s, so and then adds to v o, so we'll get you this. Now, we're going to call this factor um, that we're going to call it loop gain. Indeed, if you go around the loop you have A of S times F, and that will be uh, sort of the total gain of going around the loop. Um, now, depending on what A of S is, the resulting um, transfer function of this capital e of a, e, a of S, which is the amplifier with feedback closed, will be different than just what this, the the amplifiers A of S is. And depending on F, that will also change. So we're, what we're going to do today is look at how these things change from sort of the amplifier we start from, which is uh, small A of S, to actually when we close the loop, what happens with the frequency characteristics of the amplifier, uh, which is the closed loop amplifier A of S. So let's do a few examples. So. Um, So a simple example, let's say, let's assume a single pole system. Because we, we normally, when we did the analysis, said, okay, well, A of S, usually we ha will have like one dominant pole. and Maybe we can neglect all the other poles. So let's see what happens in that case. So that case will have some transfer characteristics like this, for example, which is just AO, uh, A naught over one minus SP1. And if you gen just plug everything into A of S, you're going to get A O over 1 minus S over P1. And then over here, 1 plus F times A O 1 minus S over P1. If you uh, work this out, multiplying by 1 over minus S P1, you get 1 minus S over P1 times, uh, well, plus, let's see, AOF, right? And then if we pull out 
1 plus AOF. From here, we'll, we're going to get something that looks like this, P1 times 1 plus AOF. Now, this is interesting because this piece does, is not frequency dependent. And it is kind of the gain of the closed loop amplifier at DC. Uh, it consists of the gain of the ampli of the DC gain of the amplifier, which is a naught, and also the constant feedback factor. Okay, so this is the type of analysis over here that we would do, disregarding any capacitance in the circuit and just looking at what the what the gain and the feedback is. Now, this piece is still a single pole system, so it has a dominant pole, but now the pole has changed. So. Um, with A0 being A0 over 1 plus uh, A0F, um, the pole, we will call it closed loop pole P1, is now P1 times 1 plus A0F. So the pole has increased in magnitude by exactly the same factor as the gain, the DC gain has decreased. So we're going to label this quantity T0 just like here we have T of S being F times A of S, right? So that's the loop gain. So the, the magnitude of the closed loop gain decreased by 1 plus T0. And also the pole increased by that same amount. So, so this loop gain definitely is a factor in, in moving the poles around. If we go and draw the, uh, let's say, if j omega, this is essentially the, the, the gain, the body plot. I will do like uh, omega on a log scale here. So on the first one, what you're going to have is um, up until P1 you have the gain of 20 log 10 of uh, A0. So this is our normal um, amplifier. And then we'll have minus 20 dB per decade after the pole, since we have a single pole. Now, depending on what um, feedback we apply, what F is, we're going to set, set what A0F is. So with that, we're going to have another point here, which is uh, 20 log 10 So what we have done here is, and then this point obviously is going to be P1 times 1 plus T0. So this difference, given that the top is A0, and this one is just A0 divided by 1 plus T0. So in log scale, that's the difference of the two in dB. So this range over here, will be 20 log 10, 1 plus T0. Right. Or essentially, what we're doing, we're shifting the characteristics down by 1 plus T0 in dB. And then we're also moving the pole out. So we're sliding along this 20 dB per decade curve. Right? If we decrease by 10x the gain, we're shifting the, the frequency by 10x. And that's exactly kind of the 20 dB per decade plot, right? Because 10x is 20 log 10 of 10 is 20, right? So that's how you, you will. Sl so everything that happens in this curve is essentially a constant um, product of the gain and the pole. Okay. So that's why this frequency is also interesting. That's our unity gain bandwidth frequency, which says, okay. Uh, 
the max uh, that as long as you're riding on this curve, gain times the bandwidth, which wherever you choose to have your bandwidth will essentially be constant. Now, I am choosing this point over here simply by adjusting the f, this component over here, which is a0f. So I'm adjusting really the f. And if a0 is reasonably large, which that will almost always be, then 20 log 10 of a0 over 1 plus a0f is approximately going to be 20 log 10 of 1 over f. So you see that I'm actually choosing this close, and this is obviously going to be the, the closed loop gain, is roughly proportional to just the feedback factor, which you know kind of from ideal op-amp type analysis, right? Um, so by choosing the, this feedback factor, by how I tie, let's say, the resistive dividers or capacitors or whatever, I have passive components around my uh, op-amp, I will be choosing this um, closed loop operating point and choosing how much I shift my pole. Right? So the other way to kind of represent that is um, in a root locus. Uh, plot. Um, how many people heard about root locus things? Okay, so so uh, this is essentially just um, a, dis a graphic display of um, the poles of um, A of S in in the in the complex plane. So um, and um, what we have here is that, for example, um, since we have real poles um, in amplifiers typically, um, at least this one pole is definitely going to be real. If we have two poles, then we'll have complex conjugates. Um, but in this case, we're starting from P1, and it's going to be a negative pole, right, because the system is stable. And then by amplifying by choosing the feedback factor f that corresponds to t0, we'll be moving that pole to some location that is p1, 1 plus t0 uh, prime, let's say. Uh, this point over here corresponds to t0 equals 0. All right, so if there's no feedback, my pole is p1. If I have feedback, I'm pushing that pole essentially to infinity uh, if my um, if my t0 increases, right? So here, t0 equals t0 prime. That's some, some value we chose. OK. So life seems to be pretty good and simple when we have a single pole amplifier, right? We can ride on this 20 dB per decade curve and know how much more uh, bandwidth we get once we close the feedback. Um, Let's see what happens if we have um, a little bit more complicated situation. So say, what if um, is more than one, one pole? Anybody see wh where that situation can occur? Pole at the input or the, at the output, um, yeah, that's one scenario. Another could be that you have another stage, right? So every stage pretty much will add some pole together with it. So the more state, at least it will have one. It will add one, right? Uh, and then it may, it, may, it will through this through the Miller, it will also affect kind of the, the guy before that. So adding stages will kind of keep your poles shifting. But to the first approximation every stage will likely add at least a pole, right? So you have two stages, that's two poles, three, three stages, at least three poles, okay? So 
So let's take an example um, where it's actually three poles, for example. So you're going to get something like this. Now, just for the ease of analysis, what I'll assume is that um, these poles are actually kind of a decade apart, because then it's easy for me to draw, draw things. Um, we're going to assume that, you know, if I was drawing uh, root locus of just this A of S, uh, then you would have like, okay, let's say P1 is the dominant one, and then P2, and then let's say P3, right? They're like a, dec a decade apart. Um, okay. So let's draw some transfer functions, see, see how this A of G omega looks like. Um, So we start from some DC gain, and that DC gain is going to be 20 log 10 of uh, A0. When we hit P1, which is the first pole, we're going to sl start sliding down by minus 20 dB per decade. Then we're gonna hit pole two, and pole two um, is going to start dropping this by another 20 dB per decade. So this is going to be minus 40 dB. And then we hit pole 3, and it starts dropping this at minus 60. So let's take a look at what the phase looks like. So it's the same log scale omega axis. Just here I'm plotting the angle of, or the phase of uh, A of J omega. But how much does the phase, so if the phase starts at zero, by how much does the phase decrease after the first pole? Any guesses? Yep, 90 degrees. So in Bode approximation, we're gonna kind of draw it so that at, at the pole, it's kind of hitting minus pi over four, but then after the pole, it sort of will settle at 90. Right. So, um, okay, so we have this, pi over two minus, the, uh, minus pi, minus three pi over two. So, it would be hitting this pole, and then finally settling somewhere here. So, phase is going to look something like this, and then starting to go down like somewhere here. Okay. The important thing is what is happening at the point where phase of A of J omega becomes minus pi. So we're going to call this frequency omega 180. And this gain here will be 20 log 10. Uh, we're going to call this A180. Does anybody know why this gain is important or this particular uh, frequency, omega 180? Yeah. 
Take a look at our amplifier here. Okay. We're assuming at DCA is positive, right? That's why we added this negative sign over here. The idea was that if VI increases, this V error will increase, then um, VO would increase. Because F is just a ratio, then VF would increase and suppress VE, right? So VE would then drop, and so will VO. Okay, so we will have essentially a stable output. So that assumes that A is positive, so that when VE increases, VO increases. And also then we're, we're doing this negative sign over here to be able to subtract the error, the output, the ratio of the output through the feedback. So this is the basic premise of our feedback, that A is positive, right? At Omega 180, um, so angle of, of J omega 180 is actually pi or minus pi, right? So definitely that gain is, is, is real, but it's not positive, it's negative, right? So what happens then is that um, we have a situation where um, you know, VI increases, VE increases, VO decreases because the gain is negative. If VO decreases, VF decreases. If VF decreases and we have a negative sign, that means that V error increases. Okay, which means that VO decreases even further. So we have this constant thing where in every loop around, we're just getting more and more signal, more and more error, more and more output, okay? So obviously, we're not stabilizing anything, okay? So that's why this, this parameter, this frequency is critical. So at, if we have, um, If we have, uh, at this omega 180, if we have um, A 180 times F in magnitude greater than one, then what we're feeding back in positive feedback would not die out, because it's not gonna be a series of uh, powers of something that is uh, smaller than one. Right, then that would kind of die out. But this way, it will sort of get amplified across the feedback. Okay. So what we're going to be looking at um, next are the criterions in which what happens with the total loop gain at this frequency where A changes sign. So where A changes sign, you better have a total loop gain to be less than one. Otherwise, you're going to start actually getting positive feedback. Right. So this is positive feedback, um, and this is a negative feedback. Okay. Another way um, to analyze this whole situation was with Nyquist or Nyquist criterion. So I'll mention it just here, you know, as a due diligence, but usually it will be easier for you to look at just the Bode plots, because we're not gonna have super complex situations. But um, in the Nyquist criterion, what we're gonna do is uh, plot the, the value of T of J omega, um, which equals A of J omega times F as omega goes from um, 
minus infinity to plus infinity. So if we select just the value of omega equals zero, because things should be kind of symmetric, both sides, so we're going to just select the value of uh, uh, zero. So for omega equals zero, we're going to start with t zero. That's our familiar DC loop gain, right? It's a zero times f. And then, since t is really just a of j omega times f, and we know that um, from the previous slide, we know that the phase of a, a of j omega decreases, right, with frequency, because it's going to hit the first pole and start going down. Same way, same thing is going to happen to that a of j omega times a constant, right? So it has the, exactly the same phase. So you're going to start going down in phase. So again, let's say this vector will be absolute value of t of j omega. And this angle here will be angle of t of j omega. Maybe I should do a, a bigger drawing. OK, let me. So as you start going down, this is omega. This is omega equals zero. This is omega goes to infinity, or omega greater than zero. Okay. Then this magnitude here will be t of j omega. And then this angle here will be angle of t of j omega, which, according to what we've seen in the Bode plus, this is really the phase of a of j omega. Okay. So then we're moving across. And now what, what is going to happen is that at the time we, the angle becomes pi, Okay. That's the same thing as in the previous plot, this omega 180. Okay. That's where our phase became pi. So we have to see what a 180 times f is. If that is greater than 1, that means that we're going to cross this axis at, this will be a 180 um, times f. And omega will be equal to omega 180 at this point. Okay. So if this point is greater than minus 1 on the axis, then means we have a, a 180f in magnitude is bigger than 1. Okay. So that means we'll be going something like this. And then as we're continuing, this is for omega goes to infinity. We're getting something like this. I'm not a best, not drawing this the best. It should be smooth. <laughs> anyway, you, you, you get the point. Um, so the point is that if you see this plot crossing the real axis at a point which is larger than minus or more negative than minus 1, and it's looping around this point minus 1, this is a coordinate minus 1, 0, that means that your uh, system is, uh, is going to be unstable. Okay. Uh, your closed loop system is unstable. And the, the amount of encir encirclements around this means how many 
right plane poles you're going to have um, in the closed loop. Okay. So the way we simplify this, this criterion, so the, the, so the Nyquist criterion will be that um, this Nyquist plot, or Nyquist, should not encircle. A stable system. Okay. So we're going to simplify this criterion by just saying that um, our sim simpler. Um. So T of J omega 180 actually has to be great, smaller than 1 for a stable system. That also just means that when we're looping this loop around, we're not really encircling minus one zero, we're going and looping before it. Because we're crossing the real axis somewhere where um, A180F is actually less, uh, uh, in magnitude, um, less than, my, than one. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at, um, again, this drawing uh, for the pole. So we're going to do back to three pole. So I'll draw it again just so that I don't overload that other figure that we had. I'm going to have P1 then. P2, P3, and then the cross, and then here we have again the same values. So this will be our phase. And of course, one point of interest is this crossing, this, as we said, this one eight, omega 180. But what, what I want to show is another line. And that line is going to be, um, let's say, in the first case, we can choose it to be um, blue. Okay, so let's choose it to be here. This line will be 20 log 10 of 1 over f. So let's call it this 1 over f1. So from the previous diagram, we said that this will be our 1 plus t0, right, in, in dB. Um, or as we are, so let me just, uh, so indeed here it is 1 plus t0, but let me just make it 1 plus t of j omega. DB, right? 
or magnitude of TOJMA. So what's happening here is that um, as we are increasing the frequency, the loop gain T of j omega, which is the difference between this D DC value and, uh, and this A of j omega curve uh, decreases. So at this point over here, we're getting that the loop gain is exactly equal to 1. And then after that point, so all this region over here is um, magnitude of T of j omega is actually smaller than 1. Okay. So this is what we could call a safe zone, right? So all we need to make sure is that this point where A turns negative does not occur before we switch t of j omega to be less than 1, right? If t of j omega turns to be less than 1 before omega 180, then we have a stable system. Okay. So, in, for example, if we chose a different, so in this case, let's say at 180, um, this is what I would call my gain margin. At this point over here where I've really crossed, so where I have a unit gain, um, I want to see what is my phase. So if the phase is positive, I'll call this phase margin. And this will be in this greater than zero. Okay? If phase margin is greater than zero, I'm still safe. Because I know at unit gain for the loop, I, I'm still not at pi. Okay? So I still have some margin. So by gain margin and phase margin, you can use them interchangeably to essentially signify that you are stable or unstable, right? rather than saying I'm encircling on like Nyquist diagram and stuff like that. So just by using these two. Now, let's take a look at the example of what happens if we choose, um, let's say, choose another f equal to f2. And let's say that, that f2 is actually larger than f1. So we have it so that we have 1 over f2 is to be lower, right? So let's say it's here. What happens in that case? What's happening with my loop gain at omega 180? So omega 180 is still here, right? So my loop gain is then this distance. And it's positive in dB, which means it's greater than 1, right? So if my loop gain is greater than 1, I'm unstable. Said differently, if I looked at um, at which point I'm reaching uh, a gain of 1. I see that this is for the phase that is um, ninety degrees down almost um, 
from my uh, minus pi point. So my phase margin is minus 90 degrees, which is I'm way over where I should be. Okay. And this is the same amplifier. We just tied the feedback differently. Right? We just used a different F factor. For different configurations where you want different closed loop amplification, right? So these points, 1 over F1 and 1 over F2, this is your closed loop, um, you know, um, A02, and we'll call this uh, 20 log 10 uh, A01. These are the choices you make for the um, gain of your closed loop system. So same op amp, I just tie it differently. I'll have sometimes stable, sometimes unstable behavior. Right? Okay. So um, if we draw that in, um, in terms of the normalized, well, let me actually first just draw you the, for the blue, for the blue one, we can also just jot down real quick the Nyquist diagram just so you um, have it. You would start from T0 and then go around and here, and a minus 1 would be here. So in terms of the, the frequency response of the overall amplifier, obviously, as I'm moving things around, the bandwidth is going to be changing. So I want to sort of normalize that axis. And even if I normalize the gain, as I'm choosing different things for f, I'm going to be having different phase margins, as we saw. And so um, let's say this is this unit gain, uh, bandwidth frequency. Um, so for, let's say, 90 degree phase, I'll have kind of a nice uh, single pole kind of behavior. And this is minus 20 dB per decade, right? Uh, this is 90 degree phase march. If I have multiple poles, then I'll, I'm going to start playing with margin, right? So, um, if I have, uh, if I get uh, one over f to be uh, high enough, uh, then or f to be low enough, I will have sort of a reasonable phase margin. So let's say 60% will look something like this, just a little bit of an overshoot, and then coming down here. This is minus 40 decade and 60%, 60 uh, degrees phase margin. Um, if you go with 45, you're going to get something that's an overshoot and then comes down asymptotically the same value. So this will be 45. And then as you're going down to 30, you're getting even more of an overshoot. And then as you're getting really close to pi, you're getting this really re uh, behavior where it starts essentially uh, ridiculously amplifying at that point and being, I mean, uh, unstable. Okay, so very, very frequency selective. So we call this uh, frequency peaking. And you don't want to tune your system so that it completely explodes here, overshoots. So I just want to, in the few remaining minutes, just uh, take a look a little bit at what we can do to compensate for this type of behavior. So we want to um, do something with these systems where we can ensure that as we're selecting different Fs, we have a method to uh, not get into trouble, not get into this uh, resonant uh, or unstable behavior. So if we draw the curves once more, um, let's 
just do it like this. This is magnitude. We had these characteristics where, okay, at pole one, we start descending mildly, then a little bit more, and then finally a lot. Um, and then here we had minus pi over 4 over here. Minus pi, minus 3 pi over 2. Okay, this is our phase and, and, and amplitude characteristics. Now, if I select any, any f, and it could be as low as the one that we talked about earlier. 20 log 10 of 1 over f. And this is 20 log 10 of a0. Because I have these three poles and I've selected uh, 1 over f that's so low that I'm actually crossing, uh, this is omega 180. Right, I'm crossing it at the point where I have pretty big um, closed loop gain, then I have a problem, right? I have an unstable system. So I want to do something to it to change this characteristic of A of J omega so that um, at uh, pi I'm actually, um, or, or at this omega 180, I, ha I don't have, uh, the gain greater than one, right? So one way to do it, and this is kind of the easiest way to do it, is to do narrow bending. Means add, so you can either add a dominant pole, or shift P1, um, to lower omega. So what this means is that I can either choose to add additional pole to the system, and I'll draw it in a minute so you can see what happens. Or I can say, well, I already have too many poles. Maybe I can take one of the, the ones that I have, which is already kind of dominant, P1, and make it be even more dominant, being even lower in frequency. Okay. What happens, so doing a is kind of uh, not really advantageous because we're already, um, we already have too many poles and taking something that's even lower than P1 means I'm gonna ha be, have to add a lot of capacitance somewhere. And um, you'll see already in the lab where you're adding kind of quite a bit of capacitance in, a, in excess of uh, let's say 1000 picofarads sometimes. So it's really impractical to have too large uh, a cap added to the circuit to get PD lower than sort of the poles you already have. So um, I just show you the example of how we were going to, if we move P1, what happens. Uh, what I really want to do here is, for example, if we look at P2, at P2, I know I have 45 degrees or pi over 4 between minus pi and this point uh, at frequency P2, right? That's just inherent in, in me having a second pole there, okay? So if I pick that point and say, look, I'm going to shoot for the loop gain to be one exactly at P2. Okay, so shoot for T of, uh, JP2 to be equal to 1. 
That means that I'm crossing, at P2, I'm crossing this 20 log 10, 1 over F, right? Because I have, I have 0 dB. And that means, since before P2, I only have one pole that's lowering the characteristics, that I have to go, oops, um, no, we don't want that. I have, I have to go here with some slope that is 20 dB per decade. The same slope as here, minus 20 dB. So, so this point, this, let me just do red, maybe it's better, or green. Um, okay. So this has to be 20 dB per decade. Simply because before that I only have one pole. And then I'm going to go all the way up, maybe up to here, right? Okay, I'm not the best draw as you can see. So it's even more like something like this. It has to be parallel to this essentially, right? This point of intersect here will be my new P1 prime. So I'm taking this pole P1 and I'm shifting it all the way here. If I can do that, then my new characteristics starts from here, drops as minus 20, and when it hits P2, I have unity gain uh, for the loop, and I know I have 45 degrees of phase march. Okay. So, um, the new phase will actually look a little bit different, right? Because at P1, I have to already drop by uh, minus pi over 4 and then asymptotically stay at minus pi over 2 up until I start hitting the, the next, uh, next pole, right? So this will be my new phase characteristics, but then it's going to join this one and go down, right? Okay. So this way, my new bandwidth, so to speak, is really um, uh, P1 prime for the amplifier for the closed loop. It's P2, right? Because that's how much I've lowered my um, my gain. This is much better than if I had to go, so uh, we can write the expression. So for P1 prime will be equal to P2 over A0 times F, right? Because I want the ratio of P1 prime to P2 to be exactly equal to a0 times f, All right? So I can lower it from A0 down to 1 over f. Now notice that if I, instead of uh, P2 here, if I kept P1 and I wanted to add another pole that is even lower, then this PD will be P1 over A0 f. So it would be way, way low, right? And would require a lot more capacitance to be added. So that's the trick we're doing. We're getting more bandwidth, plus we have less cap to add. OK. Um, we'll stop here. So this method is called narrow banding, and you'll see it in lab. Two. That's like why this big cap C is being added. Uh, we'll do next time sort of a, a circuit example about this, and then hopefully move to kind of Miller compensation, things like that. So it'll be Friday. OK.